the 31st annual Sydney B. Sperry Symposium, Go Ye Into All the World, Messages of the New Testament Apostles. The following presentation, An Approach to the First Epistle of Peter, was given by Dr. Terry Ball from BYU's Religious Education. Brothers and sisters, thank you so much for being here. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to share with you an approach to the first epistle of Peter. Let me begin by sharing a story that I love to tell. It's a story about a young man who was going out on a date with a young lady for the very first time, and so he went to the neighborhood uh, drug and variety store to get something to take to her. And when he went into the store, he found that there was no sales help on the, uh, on the floor, so the pharmacist himself came out from behind the drug counter to help him. Asked him what he wanted. He said, well, I'm going out on a date. I want to take something to this young lady, so I'd like a one-pound box of chocolates and a half-pound box of chocolates and a quarter-pound box of chocolates. So the pharmacist got his order for him and was a little curious why he wanted the three different sizes of chocolates. And the young man explained, well, just for going out with me, I'm going to give the young lady a quarter-pound box of chocolates. If she lets me hold her hand, I'm going to give her a half-pound box of chocolates. And if I get a lot of kisses, I'm going to give her a full quarter pound, or full one pound box of chocolates. Well, that night he went to pick the young lady up. She came to the door and said she was going to be just a moment because they were just kneeling for family prayer. And he said, well, could I join you? And she said, certainly. And so he went in, and not only did he join the family for prayer, but he offered to give the prayer. And oh, what a prayer he gave as he just poured out his heart to God and blessed each member of that family from, from head to toe. Later, as they were walking away from her door towards her car, his car, she commented to him, you know, I had no idea that you are such a spiritual person. To which he responded, yeah, well, I had no idea that your dad is the pharmacist. <laughs> well, the story serves to illustrate the fallacy in the thinking that says, what you don't know can't hurt you. The fact of the matter is what we don't know can often hurt us. For this young man, it put him in a very embarrassing and difficult situation. And you know, that can also be said for what we don't know about the New Testament epistles. Often what we don't know about them can put us in difficult situations and in fact has led to a lot of strange doctrine in Christianity. In fact, Bruce R. McConkie, commenting on what we don't know about the epistles in a subsequent misunderstanding that accompanies our ignorance, described one epistle, that written to the Romans, as, quote, the source of more doctrinal misunderstanding, misinterpretation, and mischief than any other biblical book, end quote. Well, that particular description might fit, um, fit all the epistles as a whole. It can be conventionally argued that what we don't know about the epistles and the corresponding misinterpretation of their teachings has fostered more contention and apostate Christian doctrine than perhaps any other genre of scripture. Our ignorance arises from the fact that the epistles are generally written esoterically, meaning they are attended, intended for a select audience that has a shared understanding of questions and issues with the author, but the latter-day reader may not share that same understanding. Often reading an epistle is like listening to half of a telephone conversation. You get to hear the answers, but you have to guess at the questions that are being asked on the other end of the line. And if you guess the questions wrong, you can come up with some very strange ideas about what's going on. Let me illustrate this idea another way. Here is a passage, uh, an esoteric passage. See how well you can understand it. It reads, Yea, verily, if the balloons poppeth, the sound shalt not be able to carry, for all wouldst be too far away from the correct floor. In truth, the fellow couldst shout, but the human voice doth not carry that far, and most buildings tendeth to be well, too well insulated. And more calamity shall come to pass, shouldst there be a break in the wire. Then there couldst not be accompaniment to the message. Surely, the best situation wouldst involve less distance. Well, how would you rate your understanding of that passage on a scale of 1 to 10? It's rather difficult, isn't it? But notice how your comprehension can be improved if we have the same background information, if we're able to put this passage in the same context from which the author is uh, discussing. Let me read it to you one more time. Yea, verily, if the balloons poppeth, the sound shall not be able to carry, for all which be too far away from the correct floor. In truth, the fellow could shout, but the human voice doth not carry that far, and most buildings tendeth to be too well insulated. And more calamity shall come to pass, shouldst there be a break in the wire. Then there couldst not be accompanied to the message. Surely the best situation wouldst involve less distance. Does that seem more clear? Hopefully so. 
we are able to understand better what the passage was describing when we can put the, when we can get the picture of what the author is, is talking about. And so it is as we study, undertake the study of any New Testament epistle, it's important that we try to get the picture to recreate the context and the background from which the epistle was written. There are certain contextual questions that are really helpful to answer as we begin any study of, an, of a New Testament epistle. Some of those questions include, first of all, who was the author of the epistle? What was his experience in the church? What had been his association with the people to whom he is writing? Secondly, to whom was the epistle written? What was happening in their lives at that time? What was their experience in the church? And what had been their experience with the author of the epistle? Thirdly, when was the epistle written? What was going on in the world at that time? And what was happening in their specific lives at the time the epistle was written? And finally, most importantly, I believe, why was this epistle written? What questions and issues is the author trying to deal with? What are the doctrines that he is trying to teach? Now, what I would like to do with the remainder of the time we have together is to uh, answer some of these contextual questions to set the background and then go into the, to the doctrine taught in this wonderful first epistle of Peter. So let's consider the question for a moment, who is the author of the epistle? On the surface, that should be an easy, answer, easy question to answer. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1 clearly states that Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, is the author of this epistle. You should know, though, that many modern-day biblical scholars, particularly those who are trained in the, in, the, in the discipline of textual criticism, are reluctant to accept Peter's authorship of this epistle. For example, they say the Greek of this epistle is far too eloquent and sophisticated to have been written by the uneducated Galilean fishermen. And yet, if you read carefully in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 12, you read that this epistle had a scribe. The scribe was Silvanus, whose Greek was very good and eloquent. So that argument against Peter's authorship doesn't seem very convincing to me. Another reason they say Peter couldn't have written it is because it sounds too much like Paul, and therefore Paul's, one of Paul or, or Paul's disciples must have written this. That seems like circular reasoning, doesn't it? If anyone's quoting who, who would quote who? Would an apostle quote the prophet, a leader of the church, or would the leader of the church quote the apostle? Is Peter quoting Paul, or is Paul quoting Peter? And moreover, if they sound the same, couldn't it most likely be because both authors were getting their inspiration and direction from the same source? Some would also say, well, Peter couldn't have written it because this language of this text is so mild and patient and meek and humble that it couldn't have been written by the brash and impetuous Peter, the Peter who threw himself on the Sea of Galilee to walk to Christ, the Peter who sliced off the Roman soldier's ear, the Peter who dashed into the empty tomb. That's not the Peter that we know. I don't find that argument convincing either. I'm not so sure Peter is as impetuous and brash as they claim. But even if he had been, I believe this epistle was written after about three decades of his having served as the prophet, the leader of the church. Would you think that maybe three decades of serving as a prophet would humble and mellow you and teach you patience? I think so. And so I can find no convincing reason not to ascribe um, authorship of this text to Peter and many convincing reasons to conclude that he did write it. Next question, to whom was the epistle written? Well, again, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1 says it is written to the strangers who are scattered throughout, and it lists various provinces of Asia Minor. Um, I don't know if I'll pronounce this correctly, but Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Cappadocia Asia, and Bithynia. The provocative term in this particular passage is strangers. In the Old Testament, strangers is used to describe um, Gentiles, those who are not part of the covenant people. But in this text, the word strangers is is uh, translated from the Greek word peripedemos, which literally means a resident foreigner, someone who is living outside of his native country. Many people reading that conclude then that this is written to the Jews who had been driven out of the Holy Land and were living then in Asia Minor. Uh, the second verse of the first chapter um, notes that it was written to the elect, who we assume to be the members of the church. My feeling is that this epistle was probably written to both Jew and Gentile who were living in these areas of Asia Minor at that time, and who in a very real sense were strangers, resident aliens, members of the community of the faithful and of the saints who were living resident as resident aliens in a very wicked world. The third contextual question, when was the epistle written? Those who want to ascribe authorship to someone other than Peter want to say it was written late, perhaps between 95 to 115 A.D. But believing that Peter wrote it, I think we can find a clue for the date of its authorship in the fifth chapter 
of 1 Peter. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 13, there is a greeting sent from the church at Babylon. Now, Babylon, we think, is a metaphor being used to refer to Rome. And we know that Peter was in Rome sometime around 62 to 67 A.D. And, and I believe he probably wrote this epistle somewhere between 62 to 65 A.D. Uh, from Rome, not too long before his martyrdom. And finally, why was the epistle written? You know, scholars are divided over the purpose of this epistle. Some see it as merely a baptismal sermon or liturgy. Others see it as a collection of hymnic material with a corresponding commentary. Others would say it's nothing more than an ethical treatise. But a widely held and I think very valuable way to look at the text is to view it as an epistle written by Peter to warn and prepare the saints in Asia Minor for persecutions that are soon to come upon them. If that's the approach we take to it, we can see that this first epistle of Peter is doing much as the 58th section of the Doctrine and Covenants does for the saints in our time. You know that the saints, when they originally began settling in Jackson County, Missouri, were excited about the idea that they were going to build and establish Zion and usher in the millennial reign of the Savior. On August 1st, 1831, the prophet Joseph Smith visited Jackson County, Missouri for the first time. The saints gathered expecting to hear some kind of encouraging talk about how to build Zion. But instead, he warned them of tribulations and trials that were to come. He said in the 58th section, starting with the second verse, For verily I say unto you, Blessed is he that keepeth my commandments, whether in life or in death, and he that is faithful in tribulation, the reward of the same is greater in the kingdom of heaven. Perhaps those saints scratched their head and thought, Joseph, why are you talking about tribulation? But the prophet continued, Ye cannot behold with your natural eyes for the present time the design of your God concerning those things which shall come hereafter, and the glory which shall follow after much tribulation. For after much tribulation come the blessings. Wherefore the day cometh that ye shall be crowned with much glory. The hour is not yet, but is nigh at hand. Remember this, which I tell you before, that ye may lay it to heart and receive that which is to follow. You see what Joseph is trying to do? He knew of the Jackson County persecutions that were coming, and he's trying to prepare the saints to deal with those and not lose faith, faith in the face of that adversity. Likewise, I think Peter is writing the first epistle to try and bolster the saints to prepare them for the persecutions that are to come. For example, in 64 AD, Nero, the emperor at that time, in a drunken stupor, set fire to Rome. And then, to absolve himself of any blame, he accused the Christians of doing it and instituted a huge persecution against the Christians. A historian who lived at that time named Tacitus recorded the persecutions and described them. In his, and in his description, he gives a rather interesting view of how Christians were viewed by the Gentile world. In referring to Nero blaming the, the fire on the Christians, he said, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures upon a group hated for their abominations, whom the populace called Christians. Christus, from whom the name had its origin, had been condemned to death in the reign of Tiberius by the procurator uh, Pontius Pilate. And the pernicious superstition, thus suppressed for the moment, was breaking out again, not only in Judea, the original source of this evil, but even in Rome, where all things horrible or shameful from all parts of the world collect and become popular. First then, those who confessed membership were arrested. Then, on their information, this is referring to Christians, great numbers were convicted, not so much of guilt for the conflagration as of hatred of the human race, and mockery was added to their deaths. They were covered with skins of wild beasts and torn to death by dogs, or they were nailed to crosses, and when daylight fell, were set on fire and burned to provide light at night. Nero had offered his gardens for the spectacle and was providing circus games, mingling with the populace in the dress of a charioteer or driving a chariot. Hence, though they were deserving of the most extreme punishment, a feeling of pity arose because of the savagery of one man. Terrible persecutions. We know that in addition to the Neronian persecutions, the saints also endured persecutions under Domitian in 95 AD and then later in 112 to 113 AD under Trajan. I believe that Peter knew those were coming. And so he wrote this epistle to try and bolster them and prepare them so that they could maintain faith in the face of the persecution that lay just over the horizon. As we study Peter's first, uh, uh, first epistle then, we can, I think, garner from the text what I call Peter's principles for persevering under persecution. Say that ten times real fast. Uh, what I'd like to do now is to go through and look at some of those principles with you. I won't have time to look at all of them, nor to review all the scriptures that support each of the principles. But may I encourage you in your own personal study sometime to read First Peter 
with that idea in mind, what principles is he teaching about how we can endure persecution and still stay faithful? The first principle I think I see Peter teaching in this epistle is the idea that in the face of persecution, it's important that we remember who we are. Some of you youngsters probably heard that phrase from your parents just as you were going out the door on a date. They say, remember who you are. You know that church leaders and parents often give that kind of counsel when they want us to remember um, who we are and that they're worried that we're going to face trial and adversity that we may fall into if we don't remember who we are. You know, remembering that we're children of God, that we have a divine heritage and that eternal life is our goal really makes it difficult to sin or to abandon our faith. Realizing that, then Peter tries to teach that principle to the, to the saints there in Asia Minor. He reminds them that they are elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father there in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. He tells them that they have been uh, sanctified by the sprinkling of Christ's blood and reminds them that they have an inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled, that will fade not away, reserved for them in heaven. Certainly that kind of perspective would give great faith to those in the face of, face of persecution. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, he reminds them once again, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. In addition to remembering who they are, Peter knew also they would be better suited to maintain faith in adversity if they could realize there is some value in adversity. That's a fundamental principle of Latter-day Saint theology, isn't it? That hardships and trials and blessings uh, can be a blessing to us. That they teach us, they humble us, they bring us closer to God if we handle those things properly. The way Shakespeare put it, he said, Sweet are the uses of adversity, which, like the toad, ugly and venomous, wears yet a precious jewel in his head. I didn't know that a toad was venomous. They're certainly ugly. But what the bard is trying to tell us is that when we face adversity, we ought to look for how we can benefit and grow from it. And so Peter tried to teach them the same principle. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 through 9, he said, Though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. The word translated there as tem temptations is probably better translated as trials. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perishes, that it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. You see what he's saying? Stay faithful through all of this, and you'll come out with gold from the trial and adversity and receive the end of your faith. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 13 through 14, he told them in the face of adversity, Rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad with exceeding joy. If ye are reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. Well, great blessings can come if we maintain faith in adversity. And remember um, that there is great value that can come from adversity if we'll respond to it in an appropriate way. Next, another very important principle is that when we are facing adversity and persecution, it's important that we maintain our personal righteousness. If we abandon our faith and start breaking commandments in the face of persecution, then we start to say to ourselves, well, we deserve this. God's forsaken us. The prophet Joseph Smith understood that we have to have an understanding that we're living a life pleasing to God if we're going to have faith to salvation. In the lectures on faith, he said, an actual knowledge to any person that the course of life which he pursues is according to the will of God is essentially necessary to enable him to have that confidence in God without which no person could obtain eternal life. It was this, meaning the idea that I'm living a life pleasing to God, it was this that enabled the ancient saints to endure all their afflictions and persecutions. If we don't have the confidence we're living a life for being disobedient, not being righteous, we cannot have the confidence that God is blessing and watching over us. And so Peter admonished them to stay faithful regardless of the persecution. Per persecution. He told them, um, he said, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind and be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversations. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Later in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 and 11, he admonished him to lay aside all malice, all guile, hypocrisy, envies, and evil speakings. 
he besought them to abstain from fleshy lusts, which war against the flesh. If they could keep themselves righteous, they could help. It would help them maintain the faith then to, to, to keep the commandments and to know that God is blessing them and thereby endure persecution and come out of it being strengthened thereby. Next, Peter throughout this epistle admonishes them to love and strengthen one another. When hardships and persecution come, the community of saints needs to be able to support one another and find strength within that community. And so Peter, as he spoke to them, encouraged them that they would, that seeing ye have been purified, of, that seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. In the storm, there has to be a shelter, and it's the community of saints that provides that shelter. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, he said, Be ye all of one mind, have compassion one of another, love as brethren, be pitiful. That word pitiful it literally in the Greek means to have tender innards. And the idea is not to be pitiful, but to, to have pity towards one another. And then he says, be courteous. Isn't that an interesting idea? We ought to be courteous, too, even in the community of faith in the face of persecution. He spoke to the elders of the church in the fifth chapter of the epistle. I love this chapter, as he speaks of them as being shepherds who have a responsibility to feed the flock. I think he's echoing the words that he was told on the shores of the Sea of Galilee by the Savior when he was asked, Peter, lovest thou me? And after giving his response, he was admonished, feed my sheep. And so Peter says in the fifth chapter, The elders which are among you I exhort, feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. And then he gave this promise, if they would love and strengthen one another such a way, that when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. He also knew the importance of husbands and wives strengthening one another. Certainly when difficult times comes, our spouses are the greatest source of support and can be the greatest source in helping us maintain faith in the face of adversity. And so he counseled wives to be in subjection to their husbands and says that if any of your husbands obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. Behold, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. The idea being, wives, you be strong. So if your husband is struggling, you can strengthen them. And likewise, he counseled the husbands, dwell with your wives according to knowledge. Give honor unto the wives as unto the weaker vessel, as being heirs together of the grace of life. He's trying to tell them, husbands, remember, you need to support your wives because you're going to gain eternal life together. The family is the basic unit of exaltation. And he went on and said, you need to do that, that your prayers be not hindered. That's an interesting concept. If husbands and wives aren't getting along, their prayers are hindered. Well, important counsel to husbands and wives to strengthen and encourage one another. And as a community of saints love and support one another, they will find it easier to maintain faith in the face of adversity and persecution. Peter also wanted to remind them that while they're enduring persecution, they have to they have to know that mortal suffering is only temporary, and the great blessing for those who come through it with faith are eternal. He likened our mortal suffering to grass, which is only temporary and withers and falls away. So in 1 Peter chapter 1, he said, All flesh is as grass. All the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. That's what we need to focus on in the face of persecution. This is temporary. But the blessings that will come from the Lord will endure forever if I stay faithful. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7, he says, The end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober, watch into prayer. There is an end there, he's telling them. And again, at the end of the fourth verse of the first chapter of this epistle, he promises them that eventually they will receive an inheritance incorruptible and, un and undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Focus on that instead of the temporary short-term persecutions and difficulties you're facing. Now, another really important principle, one that I think Latter-day Saints need to especially concentrate in, and that is that when we're being persecuted and attacked, there should be nothing in our actions that would give justification to our persecutors. We need to make sure that we are obedient to the law, that we don't revile back, that we don't resort to low measures and mean activities to try and get revenge. 
If we do so, then we'll be giving justification to the persecutors to continue their persecution of us. Peter drove this point home over and over again. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12, he said, Have your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which, ye shall behold, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. In the 13th and 14th verse of the second chapter, he admonished them to submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to kings as supreme or unto governors. We follow the law so that there's no justification to our persecutors. The 17th verse of the second chapter, he told them, Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. In the next verse of that chapter, he said to servants, You be subject to your masters with all fear, not only the good and the gentle, but also to the forward. If that's the law, you, you obey it. Verse 15 and 19 of that chapter, he, he gave this promise. For so is the will of God, that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. For this is thankworthy, if a man for conscience towards God endure grief suffering, and suffering wrongfully. You see the point? I want you, if when you're doing persecution, you make sure that you do nothing to deserve it. Verse Peter chapter 2, verse 20, he reasons, For what glory is it if, when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently? But if, when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is, ex is acceptable with God. And he continues, But, and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye. Be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope, that is in you with meekness and with fear. Having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evil doers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. For it is better if the will of God be so that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. Can you follow the reasoning? What an important principle. We ought to remember that whenever we feel attacked and, feel and have a desire to strike back. Um, we should never have activities that give justification to our persecutors. And if that's our mindset, we will find it easier to maintain faith in the face of hardship and adversity. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, a principle I see him teaching there is that as we face persecution, we must remember the Savior's example. Our Heavenly Father doesn't mind if the faithful suffer some to accomplish his righteous purposes. That includes even his only begotten Son. And Peter knew we could look to him as an example of how to endure persecutions and hardships and stay faithful to what we have been taught. And so he bore testimony in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. In the second chapter of the epistle, the 21st and 22nd verse, he bore witness for even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again, and when he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously, who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes we are healed. Certainly focusing on the Savior's example of staying faithful to the will of the Father, regardless of what men inflicted upon him, ought to be a source of encouragement and strength for us. You know, Peter not only taught these principles, but he modeled them, modeled them so well. We know that he was arrested many times by the Jews and imprisoned and beaten and commanded to cease speaking of Christ, and yet he continued to consistently bear witness of Christ, fearing God more than men. We know that he had to, um, he had to observe the, the martyrdom of James and Stephen, recognizing that a similar fate was planned for him if he continued to his faith in Christ, and yet he would not be dissuaded. We know, as he foretold in the second epistle of Peter, that he understood that if he continued in faith, he likewise would be required to lay down his life for his testimony. <clears throat> and he was still willing to continue to do so. I'm grateful for the example of the prophet. I suspect there may come a time in the latter days <clears throat> when we too will face persecution and difficulty. 
if we can follow the example and the teachings of this great prophet, to remember who we are in the face of adversity, saints of God, with a great promise of an eternal reward, to remember and look for the value that can come from being faithful in adversity, to live righteous lives in spite of the persecution we face, to strive to love and strengthen one another, to focus on our eternal reward, reward rather than our mortal temporary suffering, to live above reproach and to give no justification to our persecutors, and to consistently strive to follow the example of the Savior, that regardless of the persecution and adversity we face, we'll be able to maintain that faith that will lead us to our ultimate and eternal reward. May we do so and follow the prophet's counsel is my hope and prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. For more information on this program, visit our website at broadcasting.byu.edu. This presentation was given at Brigham Young University on October 26, 2002.